I have a message that I'm sharing with you called, How Are You Wired? Turn to the person next to you and have a look at them. Don't say anything, just look at them. Make an observation. What do you think? Did it look good? Did it look wired up well? Like, what do you think? What, how, how are they wired? I mean, that's, that's the key. Have you ever thought about how you were wired? Anybody ever thought about how they were wired or how they look differently or how they behave differently? Has anybody ever thought that their partner is a little bit wired differently? Sandra, did you hear me on that one? Do you think your partner's wired a little bit differently? Okay. You know, opposites attract, don't they? Amen. So uh, that's what comes in there. So bless the Lord. You know, there's a statement I like very much as a quote. The guys are getting this ready for me. Okay. This says this. May you learn to see yourself with the same delight, pride and expectation with which God sees you in every moment. How true is that? May you learn to see yourself with the same delight, pride, and expectation with which God sees you in every moment. So I don't know where Ed is. Is Ed around here at all? He's at the back. So Ed, you need to do your thing and have my slides working there, brother, because that's not working here. Okay? So that'll be nice. Thank you. Praise the Lord. We need to understand where we're at. Do you want to come and grab this from me? My IT team is really doing well praise God thank you Zechariah okay praise God we are all wired differently I love when I read the word of God I love reading about how there's so many different players or people in the word of God everything from a young girl teenage girl virgin girl called Mary who would say nothing is impossible with God I love the idea that God would use an older man at 80 called Moses and use him in such a way as to lead the children of Israel, well, they weren't Israel then, but the children of Israel out of captivity into their promised land or to see it in the future. I love it the way in which Gideon, I love the story of Gideon, how Gideon finds himself being the weakest of the weakest of the weakest, yet God says, I can do something with the weak. I love the idea that when God looks at us, he sees potential. But where we see ourselves, we can see a problem. We can see limitation. I believe that as Christians, there's a joy when we find freedom in being who we're meant to be in God. In Jeremiah 1.5, the Bible tells us that before we were even formed in our mother's womb, God knew us. Now, some of us look at ourselves and go, oh my goodness, God, what were you thinking? Because there are some things in our personality and there's some things in our being that can seem a little bit different or a little bit out there. For example, God wired you and gave you the talents to offer the world. Have you ever felt, God, why am I made the way I am? Why am I this way? I remember as a young fellow, as a teenager, I was really battling with a certain personality thing I had. And it wasn't good, but it was, I had a temper, okay? Hard to believe, isn't it, okay? But I had a temper. Now, have you ever asked a sibling or asked a parent what you were like when you were growing up? You ever done that? Have you ever, when you were courting a young lady or courting a young man, gone to their parents' house and ask what they were like as children or look at their baby photos. Yes? Sebastian, did you ever do that with Alice? Did you ever get over there and ask for stories about Alice when she was a wee girl to find out what she was like? You said you didn't have to, they just told you freely? Okay, very good. Okay, that comes in there there. Maybe they said that you were just the sweetest child ever. Maybe they said you were bossy. I don't, I don't know what they said. Maybe they said you were someone who just bounced off the walls. But maybe they said that you just made mess with papers and markers. My granddaughter sticks stickers on my car window, which is my annoyance there. But, but whatever, whatever it might be, there's all things there. Or maybe they said you were a little too sensitive and perhaps for a whole year you seem to do nothing more but cry. That'd be a bit tough, wouldn't it? But sometimes our natural wirings gets mislabeled as a problem. So we struggle to see the gift and how we were made. So, so I had this 
temper problem. Now, I know that that temper problem was the result of frustration towards a father who wasn't the best role model. And I know the temper problem was the frustration because it was either being tears or being fear or react. I ended up being the react. And I can remember going to God as a teenager. And I remember saying to God, you've, I wanted to press into God, but I felt these issues. I said, God, you've got to remove this temper from me. You've got to take it out of me. It doesn't belong. You've got to take it out. And I remember God speaking to me. He goes, no, you need to bring it back to me and let it be used how I meant it to be used. Now, I remember God saying to me that before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. Meaning I put certain attributes or certain personality traits in you. And they have a purpose. It's like in Romans 11. It says, the gifts of God are without repentance. So you could be a leader and never know Jesus and still function in the gift of leadership because there's still a gift that God gave. That's what it means. I said to God, well, how could temper, or should I say, how could anger be godly? And God says, Jesus moved in a righteous anger. He overturned the tables. There was a righteous anger. He says, the problem is, is that the gift I gave you has been polluted or has been perverted or because of life's circumstances or because of whatever else it's been used the wrong way so you have to put it back now let me tell you how God normally puts it back in it normally means God's going to bench you have you ever been benched have you ever been in ministry or been in a place or be seeking something and all of a sudden God seems to bench you well we don't ever want to acknowledge it was God because that would mean God speaking to us we want to blame somebody I can remember I was the youth pastor and God was doing some great things and great growth and, and uh, the way church was set up in those days, it was called the Mount Gravatt Assemblies of God. Before that was called Mount Gravatt AOG. Well, that's what I said, but it's called Garden City Christian Church. And I can remember in those days, the pastors would sit on the stage. There'd be like two, three rows. I, I couldn't make it on the first row, but I got on the second row. One time... Rodney, who was the brother of the pastor, put me on the first row. And when the pastor came out in front of everybody, he got me to sit back in the second row. It was really embarrassing, but uh, this is the way it worked. You know, I mean, God must have felt I needed more humbling, which you might think so too. Okay. And I sit in the second row, and there's a couple of guys there with me. One guy's called David, another guy called Ian, and some others. And we're all mates, different ministries, but all mates on the platform. And I remember that the senior pastor on the Monday, because we, we had to work on the Monday, called me into his office. And whenever the senior pastor called in the office, it was a, he had a long corridor to get to his office. And I remember we used to perspire from going into his office. The senior pastor and I were okay, but we weren't great. Does, does that make sense? Let, let's be honest, he fired me three times, okay? And it was only because his brother Rodney got me my job back, otherwise I would be gone. I think I quit twice and I, he, got, he fired me three times, whatever it was. So when he called me down to the office, it was a long walk. And you could tell if it wasn't good by the other staff members' faces. Like, like you know, if they looked at you and put their head down, looked elsewhere, you knew that it wasn't a good call. You, you know what I mean? Like, you go, oh, I'm in trouble again, okay? And so I, I, I go to the office and I go, yes, pastor. He says, brother, it was always brother. I didn't know if that meant because he forgot my name or just it was a term of endearment, but whatever it was, it was brother. I said, yes, pastor. He says, the head usher, because we had head usher, we used to call them head deacons in those days. The head usher, businessmen who were on the board, Colin Lobb was one of them. He was in the attic clock. There's another guy uh, called Alan Carriage have come to me, they're on the board, and said they think you're a little bit proud. Don't you love those encouraging moments? Does that make sense? It's like just knocks it. I said, oh, well, that, that's tragic, Pastor. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And so he recommended, and I've agreed, that once a month you're not to sit on the platform with the others, but you are to serve them and serve the church in the area. Now, 
today, I asked the pastors all to serve, so it's nothing big deal. And, and I do that, like we don't sit on the stage because from my experience, I didn't think it was, I would like to sit in the front and I have all the pastors serve because I think serve is important. But you've got to remember, in my day, it was different. In my day, even the Pentecostal church, women weren't even allowed to take up offerings. I remember they did a vote at the members meeting in the 80s and it was outvoted that women couldn't even serve in a capacity as an usher. Thank God we're not there anymore, okay? So I said, well, what does that mean, Pastor? Well, once a month, you will be down with them and you will serve us and it'll be humbling, but this is what you have to go through. Well, I'm going to be honest with you, okay? Uh, I really found it humbling to start with, especially when your mates take the mickey at you. You know, as mates do. So when I came up on the stage to serve the community, they go, how's that working for you, buddy? How's that going? And you're like, Phew. you know, like, you, you know what I mean? I mean, they're mates. They didn't mean anything bad by it. They're just egging me, you know, as they do. But the issue is, is how come they didn't have to do it? Well, I know why. They look more humble than I did, okay? But I know they weren't humble, but that's, this is how it was. I had to do it for 12 months. 12 months. And I remember at the end of the 12 months, the pastor called me back in because Colin and Alan felt I'd passed the test, okay? And uh, called me back. Oh, Jenny's laughing because you know what I'm and, and they called me back into his office, that long walk, and I thought, what's next? All right. He says, you've passed the test. Uh, you can now get off of the roster and you can now sit back on the platform each week. And I remember I said to the pastor, I said, you know, pastor... I'm kind of really enjoying it. If you wouldn't mind, I'd like to stay this way. And he said to me, why? And I said, well, I've got to admit to you, at first I had the wrong attitude and I thought like, oh my goodness, why is it me and not them and da da da. But after a while, I found a real camaraderie and an enjoyment and an interaction. And I got to see church from the other perspective. And I said, I think it's good. Well, nobody else had to do it. It's just me still. But anyhow, I did that until I left and went over to the United States. But I put it down as a place where I was put on the bench. But your gifts can be misunderstood. Your confidence can be seen as pride. Your boldness can be seen as an arrogance. Your tenacity can be seen as hurtful. Whether you feel underappreciated by those around you or perhaps you are unrefined that causes repulsion. It's good for us to remind ourselves that God is always in control. I find that the best way to round up the corners of your giftedness is to learn to meet with the giver. And the more that I learn to press into God and press in with God, rather than listen to what other people said, the more I realized that God was behind everything and it would be okay. You see, nobody can tell you that you don't have what it takes. Because they don't understand who you are and they don't understand what you have and they don't understand what it takes. But people will always try and tell you. They'll despise you because of youth. That's not my problem today. Now, I might despise you because they think you're too old. They might despise you because you're a woman. They might despise you because you're not educated. They might despise you because you're not a Caucasian. They might despise you because you don't speak the language as well. There's all different reasons of things they do. But what you have to do is learn to be confident in who you are in God. I remember 30 years ago, we came back from America to start our church and it was in our living room because that's all we could afford. It was in our living room. Couldn't afford a car, just in our living room. I didn't know how many people would turn up, but it was about 20 in the morning, 22 at that night. And I remember we, somebody turned up at night to the service in the home. We were living in Eight Mile Plains. And they said to me, what do you have that the other churches don't have? Well, at that point, there was Jim Williams is over at what was God's Sea Christian Church and they're doing great things. Then there was... Um, this other gentleman over at what's called Christian Outreach Center and they're doing all things and moving here. And then there was a Gateway Baptist group over there for Guy, Pastor, I don't know who's over there. And, and like, you know, I'm just like 20 something people in the home. These guys are all like thousands. And so this guy came to me and says, what do you have as a reason for me to come here and not the others? Now, 
I thank God that in the 70s, the pastor encouraged us to really get into positive affirming scriptures. It was, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If God is for me, then who could be against us? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And all these things were more than conquerors. Call unto me and I'll answer you and I'll show you great and mighty things that you know not. All these scriptures were positive affirming scriptures. We call them the I am. And I thank God that I had built my basis on these scriptures. And so when I was challenged by this particular person who didn't mean anything wrong by it, but he said, what do you have to offer that the others don't? I knew I couldn't compete with buildings because I didn't have one. I knew I couldn't compete with staff. I wasn't even being paid. I knew I couldn't compete with crowd because I didn't have anyone. But then I said to this, you'll only get Sean Hansen here. Now that could sound arrogant, of course. But what it meant is this. I believed in my call. I believed in my call. Here's the biggest problem with Christians today. You don't believe in the call of God in your life. And when you don't believe in your call, nobody else will. When you don't believe who God says you are, when you don't believe what God says about you, when you don't believe what you can do, nobody else will. Because we are conditioned, we are beaten verbally by what the world says we are. You're too short, you're too tall, you're too fat, you're too thin. You're brown, you should be white. You're bald, you should be hairy. Oh, we'll leave that one out, okay? <laughs> you're a male or you're a female or you're a child or whatever else. We're conditioned. You're dumb. You're stupid. You're an idiot. All these things are projected at us. Not always intentionally, but it happens. And then this generation, you have all of the media, which is even worse. All we had was magazines. But you have all of the media on your iPhones, on your phones, or whatever else, and they're all imaging and projections about what you should do. We didn't care about fashion when I was growing up because there was no fashion. I mean, our favorite jeans were the ones we wore out. Today, they buy jeans that look worn out. <laughs> they buy jeans with rips in it. We just ripped our own jeans, I mean, because we wore them. Our denim shorts weren't denim shorts. They were the jeans that wore out, so we had to cut the legs off. That was our denim shorts. I'm not saying it was right. I just say the way it was. We didn't care about our hair. It just grew. Now I just wish I had hair. But anyhow, the fact of the matter is, that's how it works. But I won't go to the means that some will go, you know what I mean? But anyhow, that's how it goes. See, I love reading God's Word, and I love reading what God can do with somebody. I was preparing my Father's Day message. I don't want to share too much about that. But I was sharing my father, working my Father's Day message, and I called it Dead Man Walking. There you go, that gets you going. Dead Man Walking. It doesn't seem to make sense, but it will. And I was fixating on the Apostle Paul. You know, the majority of the New Testament is written by the Apostle Paul. The way in which we see structure for our church and the ministry of the gifts is by the Apostle Paul. For example, it's the Apostle Paul that outlines the gifts of the Spirit for us. He talks about the gift of administration, apostleship, discernment, evangelism, exhortation, faith, giving, healing, help, hospitality, knowledge, leadership, mercy, prophecy, serving, speaking in tongues, teaching and wisdom. It's the Apostle Paul that brings this out to us. He lays out the structure. But yet the Apostle Paul never saw Jesus walk on water. The Apostle Paul never saw Jesus feed the multitudes. The Apostle Paul never saw the woman with the blood issue get healed. The Apostle Paul didn't see Jesus healing the blind. In fact, the people that Jesus picked prior to his death were ordinary, unschooled men from Galilee, the Bible says. The book of Acts 4. When you look at them in the natural, they didn't look extraordinary. They were just normal. In fact, worse than normal, they came from Nazareth 
Capernaum area. And of course, that's where they said, could anything good come out of Nazareth? Then we come across Paul after Christ's death and resurrection. Because God uses the church. He uses people to fit his vision, not him fitting our vision. The problem is that we want God to fit our vision. God, give me the gift of leadership so I can make good money. God, give me the the gift of preaching so I can have a large church. Lord, give me the gift of healing so I can be well known. Give me the gift of singing so I can have my own recording contract. God, give me the... We misunderstand the purpose of the gifts. The gifts were given for the body. And this is where the church is out of whack. You see, God might have anointed you with the gift of administration, but boy, do we need that. Now, I, I'm not very good at administration. Don't say anything, sir. Listen, okay. I'm not very good at the gift of administration, but I'm so grateful for those who have the gift of administration. I detest administration, not the people who do it. I detest administration, but I thank God for them who do it because they keep you on the straight. And you might think, well, if I function on the gift of administration, I don't seem to be as valuable as the person speaking, but that's just not true. Because the whole thing is about Jesus, not about individualities. And the problem is, is that we have raised up individuals rather than raising up the body. Just in the last few months, just in Dallas, Texas, uh, three major churches all lost their pastor because of wrong behaviours, hidden behaviours. This is what happens when we put the emphasis on the individual then rather understanding it's the body working to give us one. I was with Pastor Danny prior to the 8 o'clock service and, and I was in the uh, community care shop that he ministers there to people and I said how's it going he says it's really hard to get everything in he said I'm out there all the time but I need somebody who could give a couple of hours a day or something else and just sit by the computer and log in to put the orders in before it goes out again and I said to Pastor Danny we need people who have that gift to plug in they might think they're insignificant but they could be retired they could be anything who have access to the thing they could just plug in this is important when I walk around the church and I, and I see the things that are being done when the side takes me on a walk something we're doing this do this there I go like where would it be without these people with these gifts because it's all working together it's all being together I know that list of spiritual gifts can seem pretty straightforward And I know some things can bring confusion, but you have to understand that the same God of yesterday is the same God today. We can all be on the same team. We can all have what I call a secured kingdom victory, but sometimes we're on the bench and the bench can feel less important than playing in the game. But to me, the bench, like in my own experience, is about where I am reintroduced to my frail humanity. And because my first reaction when I was asked to step down was like, how could they do this to me? It showed that I had a problem. Because if I didn't have a problem, I wouldn't have reacted in myself. So if I was honest with myself, just by my reaction saying, how can they do that to me, verifies that there really was a problem. Now those other guys, the David and the Ian, who never had to go and serve in those areas but had their ministry, they're not serving God today. They're not serving God today. I don't even know if they're saved. And there are things you go through and you can think it's not fair. Or the things you go through and you can think it's not just. Or there's things you go through which I call sitting on the bench. Which you might be thinking like, why am I going through this? It's because God says, I see the bigger picture. Amen. I see where you need to go. To me, the bench became something where you heal. The bench was something where I was humbled. And these are the things that kept me on the straight. Maybe the bench is the calling away to refine you to what you were called to do. Maybe the bench isn't the place you sit to watch life pass you by, but rather it's the place where you rest and let Christ pass through you. Here's the thing I always ask myself. Will I allow Christ to pass through me even if it feels like I'm being benched? What am I going to take? How am I going to react? 
One thing I love about God is that he loves everyone. Every one. He will leave the 99 and go after the one. When I hear my ministry team come and share about how they touch this one or that one, my wife teamed out with Pastor Danny, uh, I think yesterday, to do some ministry in a particular counseling skill that my wife has and teach Pastor Danny and doing it. And uh, so I was regulated to go upstairs, okay? And, uh, but see, I have this German shepherd that's just, she can't handle anybody in the house if she doesn't know who it is, right? So when I'm upstairs, I'm having a secret giggle, I shouldn't have, because I can hear the dog going off, you know, like barking around the house. But then what's even more funny is that we have this parrot that thinks it's kind of human. So when the dog's going off, if that's not bad enough, the window's shut, the dog's going, diva, no, diva, no, diva, They're yelling out at the dog. For half an hour, the parrot doesn't shut up. It just keeps yelling, you know what I mean? In the end, I felt guilty that I better go get the dog and bring it upstairs with me, okay? But not until I had a bit of a laugh. And I said to Pastor Danny this morning, did you hear the parrot? He goes, yeah, I heard the parrot, yes. What's the point? The point is ministering to the one. So when I hear about the pastors go after this one, after that one, or touch this one or that one, it may not be this, but the power is not this. The power is that one-on-one. And see, that's what you have to understand, that you might feel that your gift is limited or you might feel like your gift is not appreciated. But as you learn to be faithful, to use the gift where you are, then you leave the expansion to God. The Bible says in Proverbs that your gift will make room for you. Your gift will bring you before kings and before presidents. The problem is we want to usher it in rather than trust him. What I'm going to try to say to you is this. As a church, we need everybody functioning in that gift. I was so excited. We have to do all these blue cards now. It's all the rules and the laws and things coming in. It's a bit of a headache, but the team is great. Where anybody who serves has got to have a blue card, this protection thing. And before you get angry at the government, remember it's the church's own fault, okay? When the church won't correct itself, the government will. If the church would correct itself and do the right things, it wouldn't need the government doing it. So this is the fault. I'm looking at it as a general. This is what happens so often. Where the church turns a blind eye, government steps in. And it's pretty sad how the body of Christ of whole has let things be loose. But we need to make sure church is safe. Can you agree with me there? Yes. We want our wives to be safe. We want our children to be safe. We want it to be a safe place. But I was encouraged. Josiah was telling me, how many blue cards do you have in from our church? A hundred and... Huh? Fifteen or fifty? Hundred and fifty? 15. So there's 115 blue cards in, which is in our church. That's not a huge amount for our church size, but it's still a great amount of the people who are willing to serve. And I get encouraged, like he's 115 individual people who you might not realize do something in this church to be a blessing and a help, who rather than say, I need something bigger or better, are saying, I'm here to be a part of it. I love this statement. Sometimes stepping into our assigned gifting requires sacrifice of comfort. I want to ask yourself a question. Are you comfortable where you are? I find the best place for me to be at is when I'm being stretched. The best place for me to be at is when I'm being pushed. Now, I have a bit of a weird personality, if you didn't know already, where I don't mind pushing myself. That's why half the time I'm limping or stretching or limping up the stairs today because I probably push myself too much on the track and everything else and I've got to remind myself I'm 61 going 62. But the fact is, I enjoy that situation. So it becomes natural in spiritual areas I like to push and stretch. But we have to realise that God doesn't want you to be comfortable. He wants you to be growing. We often feel we're not qualified. So God calls these disciples who are ordinary unschooled men. And then after his death and resurrection, he calls a man called Saul, who's completely different to the ordinary men. You see, Saul is learned. We know that Saul of Tarsus is from the tribe of Benjamin. 
He's called Saul. There's a reason why he's called Saul. Because the most famous member of the tribe of Benjamin was a king called Saul. So when he is called Saul, it's like aristocracy. And then Saul, who be changed to Paul, tells us that he was a Benjamin of Benjamins. He's like in the top of his tribe. He tells us that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. When it comes to schooling and religion, he was at the top. As Socrates and Aristotle, you had Paul, who was Saul. It would be Paul who would go uh, to Mars Hill and he would debate and discuss the philosophies of life and bring in the identity of who Jesus Christ is. He was the cream of cream. He was the top of the top and he goes through great amounts telling you who he is. But God needed him for an assignment. When he got saved, the disciples didn't want to know him. When he got saved, he had to go into exile for a couple of years. When he got saved, there was a hard journey coming in. It was Barnabas, the son of encouragement, who took him under hand. But God would use him and his gifts to establish what we have in regards to the church. Paul was so committed to his goals that even when he preached and someone fell asleep and fell out the window and died, he kept preaching all the way down, healed them, rose back from the dead and went all the way back up and kept preaching. Now that's commitment. But in 1 Samuel 17, I'm reminded of the shepherd boy who you all know about called David. He's overlooked by his family. His father Jesse says, don't call him in, just leave him in the field. His brothers despise him when he comes in to see what all the commotion is about. They call him a troublemaker. When the king sees him and he says, I'll handle the giant that you're all scared of, the king says, but you're only a boy. And when the king tries to dress him in the armour, David says, I'm not familiar with this. I can't wear it. But see, but what we don't understand is that God gets us ready. God prepares us. God anoints us. Our children's leader, young Lacey, she's a little dynamite. Josiah gave me a Sunday night on September the 8th or the 11th, whatever it is, the 8th, thanks, Sarah. It's the administration, you need that, okay? And gave me this gap time then. I said, let's put the little fire rocket up and see how she goes. And I said, oh, she must be at the back because I just heard a yeah, okay. So, so I said to her, Sarah, do you think you can handle it? She says, can I handle it? Can I handle it? Like, just let me loose. So I'm going like, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Now you could say, well, she isn't learned enough. She isn't tried enough. Well, in the natural things, you're probably right. But there are some things that says that God takes just a shepherd boy who's been out there battling with a lion and a bear. And when others are hesitant, they just say, well, you know, I've got a slingshot and I've got a couple of good stones. Just give me a head to shoot. Yeah. So you don't know what God can do because you underestimate how God's training you. My upbringing was my training. As much as I might have hated it, it was still my training. My life's experiences are all part of my training. So rather than despise it, I understand to celebrate it in God, that God will lead me to do certain things and I need to be open to his leading. It's the same thing for you. You can't allow jealousy or uncertainty to happen. When Saul saw David being raised, he was filled with jealousy because he felt he owned the gift. But God is the gift giver. If he can give it, he can also recall it. So we have to walk in a humility to say that God's in control. We have to walk in humility believing that God is here and he is Lord. God's kingdom is expressed through us activating our gifts. We have to reclaim as strengths those parts of us that have been mislabeled by ourselves or others as weaknesses. We want you to be you in Christ. I shared this, this morning uh, at the 8 o'clock that seeing Pastor Danny get saved some years ago, and seeing come through, I remember he came to me once, I don't even know if he remembers it, and he came to me once, he says, oh, Pastor, you know, my tattoos and my things here. And I go, so what? He said, well, you know, the church. I said, buddy, I said, that is a reflection of what was, not a reflection of what is. And if you're open, God will use that to reach people that I can't touch. See, God can use you 
with whatever you have, wherever you're from. But if you fall for the lie that says you're unqualified, or you fall for the lie that says that you're not celebrated because you're a woman or a man or because you're different uh, ethnicity or whatever else or different demographics, that's a lie that you're believing. It's not God's word. God says all things are possible. Sister, you can be restricted to a cane and, 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 and your chair, but you can still be serving some areas like helping and care by making contacts. You get what I'm trying to say? There's no restrictions. The restriction is ourselves that says I can't do it. God can move. It's like Ty. He came to uh, Josiah a couple of weeks ago and he says, look, I might not better have the money to do this, but hey, I've got skills. Let me tile and do things. Of course, under the direction of our maintenance man. <laughs> God can do anything that you give him. Josiah so was sharing the other week about, about the, the woman with Elisha and how she just had a little, I'm sorry, Elijah, she only had a little bit of oil, a little bit of flour. And the man of God said, serve me first. Could you imagine 60 minutes on that? Tick, 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 tick. Man of God steals widows, last oil and flour, leaves her for dead. We quote, first feed me. Then they add, then go ahead and die. Could you imagine what it was? How you react makes it possible or impossible for God's blessing. As we finish off church, okay. If you don't know Jesus as Saviour and Lord, if you're away from the Lord, if you don't know Jesus, we can all just say this prayer. Say Jesus. We can all say this prayer. Say Jesus. I repent of all my sins, all my wrongs. I acknowledge I need you. With my mouth I confess, with my heart I now believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of living God. I proclaim to all, I am a Christian. If you prayed this prayer for the first time, if you prayed this prayer to rededicate your life to the Lord, or if you prayed this prayer because you come from a different group and you didn't understand what it is to be a Christian, would you raise your hand right now? If this is the first time a rededication or renewal, would you raise your hand? If you didn't know Jesus and you prayed this prayer and you want to acknowledge Him, then wave your hand and I'll see your hand. See your hand. Okay, I'll see your hand. On the live stream, just let us know. If you want to talk to me at the end, I'll do that. Father, I speak your peace and grace and mercies upon each and every one.